Hi everybody and welcome back to a new episode of Diagnose Dan. Today we're working on a 2016 Volkswagen Golf Hybrid. And this car was towed to my shop and it's got a problem with the electric drive unit. So let's see if we can diagnose this one together. Now, before we continue our diagnosis, let's start with a little bit of background information on this vehicle. This vehicle is owned by a mechanic. He's stranded by the side of the road and he got the car towed to the shop he works in. He tried to diagnose it, but he realized he's got a problem with the electric drive system. He contacted me and he said, Dan, I'm not experienced with electric drive systems. Are you willing to diagnose it for me? So I said, Fair enough, and he shipped the car to our workshop. Now, in this video, we're only asked to diagnose the vehicle. We're not going to fix it. The owner is gonna take care of that himself. Now, in all fairness, I already took a look at this vehicle and I now know what's wrong with it. And it wasn't my intention of filming it until I realized that the information I needed to diagnose this vehicle is actually very hard to find. So I thought it could be helpful for you guys to film the diagnostic process. And especially with more hybrid and electric vehicles making it into the workshops. Anyway, as always, let's start out with confirming the customer's complaint. We're inside the car right now. Let's see if we can confirm the customer complaint. Now, when we take a look at the instrument cluster, you can actually see that over here it says off. Now let's turn on the ignition and let's try to start the vehicle. It's in park, I'm pressing the brake and I'm trying to turn on the car, but needle remains on off, it doesn't go to ready. Now we're also getting a bunch of warning messages in the cluster and although it's in Dutch, this one says there's a problem with the hybrid system and we need to visit the workshop. So I guess that's customer complaint confirmed. In the next step, let's try to read the fault codes. Now let's continue with reading the fault codes. Now the fault codes that are relevant for diagnosing our electric drive system are actually stored in module 51, which is the electric uh, drive motor control unit. Now the fault codes that are stored in there, and there are actually two, are drive motor A position sensor circuit range performance and drive motor A position sensor circuit A. The drive motor this fault code is referring to is actually the electric motor of this vehicle. Now the position sensor it's referring to is the position sensor of the electric drive motor. Now position sensor of an electric motor is called a resolver. Now I actually wanna use this opportunity to teach you guys a little bit more about a resolver. Now on my bench right here, I've got some material and with thanks to HR transmissions, we actually got a similar drive unit or electric drive motor as we're diagnosing in our Golf right now with a um, inverter or electric drive motor control unit. And this drive motor is normally sandwiched in between the transmission, which is over there and the internal combustion engine. Now let's use this material to learn more about a resolver. This is a three phase electric motor. And over here we can see the three different phases on these three big orange wires that normally plug into the drive motor control unit. Now, when we take a closer look at that drive motor control unit, we can actually see that DC voltage from the high voltage battery comes in over here, the positive and the negative. And the three phases to control the motor come out the other side of this control unit. Now, just like an internal combustion engine, an electric motor also needs to be correctly timed. If spark would occur randomly on an internal combustion engine, the engine is going to backfire, it's going to judder, and it's not going to run smoothly. Now, exactly the same is true for an electric motor. We can't just randomly energize these three phases or the motor might spin in the wrong direction or it might judder. It's just not going to run smoothly. Now, in order to know which phase to energize, this control unit needs to know exactly 
where this rotor is located so it can energize the right phases. Now in order to determine the position of this rotor, the direction it's running in and the speed it's running at, the control unit uses a device called a resolver and that's actually this black outer ring over here with this electrical connection at the bottom. This resolver keeps track of this tone ring with all the different shapes to know exactly where this rotor is at even when the rotor is not spinning. To take a closer look at the resolver I removed it from the electric motor. Now this is the resolver and that's the tone ring. This is a cable guide and this is the electrical connector of the resolver that comes out through this hole on the other side of the drive unit and through a wiring harness um, meets up with this connector of the drive motor control unit. Now through this hole in the unit the drive shaft actually comes in and slots into the differential of the gearbox. Now when we take a closer look at the resolver we can see all these different windings that keep track of the shapes of this tone ring. When this tone ring spins the air gap between the tone ring and the winding changes and that way it can keep track of the position of the rotor. Now these little windings are actually part of three big coils. Now every coil has got a beginning and an end. So in total we've got six wires. One, two, three, four, five, six. So that's three coils with a beginning and an end. But we've also got two additional wires which is actually for a temperature sensor. This temperature sensor keeps track of the temperature of the electric motor. So in total we've got eight connections. A resolver basically is a lot like a spinning transformer. With a transformer, AC voltage can be transferred from one coil to another through an iron core without ever touching it. When we put an oval in between the iron core and when we make sure that the air gap is small, we can see that the primary voltage, that sine wave, and the secondary output voltage are almost the same. Now when we spin the oval and the air gap gets bigger, we can see that the secondary sine wave gets smaller. The amplitude, the voltage, actually is lower. Now using this information, we now can see that this oval is spinning just by looking at that secondary sine wave. Now when we were looking at our resolver, we were actually looking at these little windings. Now I also told you there are three major coils, so six wires. There is a, a reference coil with a reference signal, which is put on there by the control unit, and this signal is always the same. Then there is a secondary and a third coil with a sinus wave and a cosine wave. Now these sine waves actually change as the iron core rotates. Now you can see that there is a different sine wave for every position of the rotor. Now the control unit exactly knows which sine wave belongs to what position of the rotor and by looking at this it knows exactly where the rotor is located. The control unit can also use the cosine and sine signal to determine the speed of the rotor. Let's speed up the rotor and let's see what happens to our signal. You can see by speeding up the rotor more revolutions of the iron core fit onto our timeline. Now by looking at this, the control unit knows exactly how fast the iron core, thus the rotor, is spinning. Now that we learned our fundamentals, we can continue diagnosing our motor position sensor problem. Now we've learned that there is supposed to be a reference signal on that primary reference coil put on there by the control unit. Now without that signal, we won't have the other two position signals. So let's begin with checking for a reference signal on that primary coil. I hooked up the Pico to the control unit looking for that reference signal and I hooked it up at the connector right there and indeed there is a signal present. Now at this point we know that at least the control unit is sending out that reference signal. So in the next step I want to focus on the other two coils of that resolver. 
Now I took a look at a wiring diagram and although Volkswagen does tell us we've got a sine wave signal and a cosine wave signal, it doesn't tell us if that's circuit A or B, so that isn't very helpful. Now, it also doesn't tell us what we are supposed to measure. We know the sine wave can vary depending on the air gap. A resistance reading number would be convenient, but Volkswagen doesn't give us that. Luckily for us, we do have got a known good spare part. Now, according to our diagram, our coil for the sine wave should be on pin five and six in this connector that's, let me see, um, this pin and, come on, that pin. And on that circuit, we are reading 51.3 ohms, so very close to 50 ohms. Now the cosine wave circuit should be on pins seven and eight that's this one and that one and that circuit is reading 49.7 so I'm pretty sure those circuits should be close to 50 ohms now on the vehicle we are diagnosing I disconnected the connector from the drive motor and that connector is right there and I hooked up my multimeter to pins seven and eight in that connector which is over there and in the car that connector and those pins are actually quite hard to reach unfortunately but pins seven and eight that circuit is actually reading 47.9 ohms so that's a good circuit now let me try to relocate my multimeter to pin five and six and do another reading now I finally relocated my pins to, or my leads to pins five and six. And that was actually very hard to do because when your hand is in front of there, you can't see the pins anymore. But I finally managed to do it. And look at this, that circuit is actually open. So that's our fault. We have got an open circuit in one of those coils of that resolver. So our diagnosis is done. We've got an open circuit in one of the coils of the resolver, and that's actually coil A, which is the, let me check, sine wave uh, coil. And the cosine wave coil is actually good. Now, what I wanna do just for fun is hook up this donor resolver to the vehicle and see if our circuit fault code disappears. Now, in order for the resolver to work, the iron core or the tone wheel actually needs to be in there. Now, when it's on the motor, it's all centered, but <clears throat> right now I'm gonna take a piece of cloth, put it in there, and right now it's centered and it's not touching the coils. So let's hook it up to the vehicle and see if our fault code disappears. So this is our setup right now. This is the donor resolver with the iron core or the tone wheel taped into it. And this is the connector for the donor uh, resolver. Right now, the original resolver is hooked up. So let's go into that, um, control unit and let's try to clear the fault codes and let's read them and right now we've got three fault codes of course we're fiddling with the car so we're setting fault codes but those two circuit faults are still there let's try to clear them and as you can see those two faults won't clear we still have got that circuit fault now let's hook up that donor resolver and see if we then can clear those fault codes so right now I hooked up the donor resolver you can see that it is hooked up to the connector and let's try to clear the fault codes again let's go into the drive motor control unit and of course since we um, had that connector off and the ignition is on we probably set a lot of fault codes so let's read them and indeed we've got a lot of fault codes but let's try to clear them and look at that with that donor resolver, no fault codes stored. Now for the ones who are really, really curious and who want to learn, just like me, I hooked up the picoscope to that cosine wave signal on the control module. And what we're gonna do, we're gonna watch that signal while I'm gonna rotate that tone wheel.
Now, another thing I noticed is with the donor resolver hooked up, every time I'm trying to turn the vehicle on, so put it in the crank position, so to say, it's actually trying to spin the electric motor. Now, of course, this won't work because the tone wheel is not spinning, so the motor is not timed and you will see it's shaking. Now, it definitely was not doing this before with the old resolver. Now, let me show you what I mean by getting into the car and trying to turn the vehicle on in the crank position a few times and you will see what I mean because you will see the motor shaking. I'm going to return the car to the customer who's a mechanic himself and he is going to replace that resolver, which isn't an easy job because it involves pulling the transmission and splitting that transmission case from the drive motor just like we had on the workbench. Now, the information in this video doesn't just apply to Volkswagen, but most hybrid and electric vehicles have a resolver that works in exactly the same way as this one. Now, I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please subscribe to my channel and when you hit the little bell, you will get a notification each time I upload a new video. And remember, diagnose then, fix it again. See you next time, guys. Well, fix it again. Well, well I kind of fixed it, didn't I? Now let's continue. Now let's continue with, now let's continue with reading the fault codes. Now that we've learned our fundamentals, we can continue dying. We can continue dying.